There's been so many people maybe have told honest things about Area 51, but there's been so mm-hmm. many, you know, stories, made up stories about people that have supposedly worked at Area 51 or different things, you know, like that fake aut- autopsy of the aliens, you know, the aliens, yes. you know, it was on Fox years ago. It, people wanted to believe so bad and people do want to believe in UFOs. They want to believe in aliens. But the, the, the point is that people can be, how can you say it, converse uh, or brainwashed very easily, some people. And, and it's, this whole thing about storming Area 51 just makes me want to throw up. Because if it does happen, I don't want one person to get hurt. I don't want one person to get a federal you know, charge against them. And I'm scared something can happen because if you do, regardless, if somebody's doing it now for financial gains, you know, because they have a business there in that area and and just trying to get people, you know, to gather. But there's going to be some people, as you know, if you worked in mental health, there's people out there that are functioning, but they can be easily conversed into other doing things. And and it scares me. I mean, to the the point that, you know, before Art died, Art Bell died, I, I asked him and he goes, I ha-, he said, I have to support Heather, okay, because of the show, but I don't believe in what she's doing. And it really bothered him because he was thinking the same way I'm thinking. Somebody could get hurt. I was so relieved when that didn't happen. And then my stomach turned like you wouldn't believe a couple months ago about the storm area 51 it started reappearing with somebody else uh, in charge of it. It scared me. I, I can see that. And uh, I share uh, your concerns because uh, um, these uh, tales are powerful and people do want to believe, even though it's different things they want to believe, they do want to believe uh, or they want to know the, the truth. And uh, because of all the misinformation uh, out there, uh, and the uh, tenacity of these uh, stories, um, I can see how people might feel very, very, very much uh, impelled to know what the truth is. Well, yeah, I think, you know, it'd be great if our government would come out and, and give us some information, be it a little or a lot or whatever. I think that the population could accept whatever they came out with. But... <laughs> I don't think Area 51 has great big vats of aliens sitting in some preservative uh, and and alien bodies are still in Area 51 in the the underground. Uh, I don't even think they have any probably alien technology there. I think it's all been transferred a long time ago. And, And that is what I'm stressing to people that are listening right now is you're going to go to Area 51 you're not going to, you're not going to, hey, if you do go, go there with an open mind, meet other people, tell and share stories. But don't do anything more than that. <coughs> Excuse me. That is great advice. And uh, um, that might be something that, uh, because you feel very strongly about it and very knowledgeable about it, um, why don't you start a counter to the dangerous one and, um, have like uh, something like that happen uh, initially on your show, but then um, it could be something where people come together and discuss the different theories of the truth and try to find the truth without putting themselves or each other in danger. I tried that before I had my fall. I actually did a show on okay. that. And you know what? I got so much hate emails that I just was in shock. Everybody's saying, how dare you talk this way? And, and, you know, it, 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 yeah, I just, you know, I I don't want to even go there because right now it's so many people. It's a, it's a big frenzy. It certainly is. You don't see it anymore on Facebook because they took it off because they were scared and, you know, liability issues and all that stuff. But I mean, this thing is still going on big time and, and, you know, the military, uh, is prepared for it. And so I, I just, don't want anybody hurt. I don't. I couldn't live with myself if that happened. You're a very good person, and you have a good heart as well as a heroic spirit. I'd love to interview you on my show uh, one day. Would you be open to that? I would love to be on the show. 
Why not? I love talking. God gave me a big mouth. You know, about me, (laughs) you know how you started out, you know, your way. My dad was an electronic technician. He was a amateur radio operator. And when I was 10 years old, he bought me a CB radio, you know, back in the early 60s. And he said, hey, you talk a lot. Here's a CB radio. He put a huge antenna up and I talked for about a year and I was bored because I could only talk, you know, well, I could talk skip. I talked where I didn't supposed to. But, you know, my dad says, okay, well, you need to go get your amateur license. I'm going to teach you Morse code. And next thing I know, I was a licensed amateur. I stayed, was stayed a li- uh, licensed amateur till I was like in my 20s. And then I kind of went other ways. But I tell you, I've been, I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy interviewing people. And uh, it, it's my life. And uh, I like bringing out information that you can't hear on other shows. You can sometimes hear on my show. Yes, I'm looking forward to review, reviewing your files and uh, getting to know your compound a bit uh, better. That's uh, that's an excellent uh, metaphor, and it sounds uh, as if a lot goes on there um, with your animals, with your research, with uh, your conquering uh, the obstacles uh, before you, and uh, so it sounds like you're very uh, busy where you are. Yeah, I'm just telling people, don't get old, because you know what? My my one son here just recently in the past month took uh, my motorcycle. I let him have it, and uh, he crashed and almost died. Ooh. He, he uh, was in the hospital for quite a while. He punctured his lung, broke a whole bunch of ribs, uh, dislocated his shoulder, and actually the ball of his shoulder shattered. All this stuff, but you know what? He's rebounding, and you know it was living hell for him for about two and a half, three weeks. But, you know, he's almost back to normal. And he's only like 20, 25. And it, it tells you at, at 25 years old, you can certainly rebound better than somebody in their 60s, huh? Yes. So I, do, I don't know. But I, I got to get, yeah, this dream thing really has got, you know, I've talked to other people about it. And you know how I originally heard about it again was going back to, a guest that Art Bell had on in the early 90s was talking about dream states that you could actually can control your dreams. You know, I listened to the guy and I go, ah, that's, you know what? But, you know, then I started trying it and it took me a long time to kind of perfect it. But, you know, I, I can kind of go to bed at night and I can actually plan and like pre-record in my head what the dream is going to be about. And that is that is awesome. Uh, a lot of people call that lucid dreaming or pre-programming uh, dreams. And yes, it does take a long time uh, to get proficient at it. And uh, as with uh, building muscles and then stopping exercise, if you stop keeping track of your dreams, you'll lose it. Uh, it's use it or lose it uh, with many things uh, in life uh, that uh, we're given or that we gain. But that is an awesome uh, gift because it allows you the possibility of uh, exploring uh, different outcomes and in uh, claiming uh, power over your life and uh, control over your destiny. And that's an awesome gift. Oh, yeah. And I, I kind of like some of the dreams. I, I feel like I off, go off world in my dreams and and explore and stuff. It just, you know, it, it's a lot better than watching TV. I can say that. I look, I, actually, yeah. I look forward to going to bed just to have my dreams. Me too. And that realm that you're describing, that's why I like adventuring uh, as well. And uh, um, like the uh, visiting your dreams, uh, you can also use that uh, technique to visit uh, places like Olympus and Asgard and Valhalla and uh, uh, a lot of the places described in the astral literature. Um, are also accessible by using uh, that technique. And uh, uh, as with any other skill in the beginning, it uh, takes a lot of practice. It takes uh, uh, some time to uh, differentiate the different uh, um, things speaking to you and which ones are you and which ones are not you. But it's ultimately phenomenally rewarding uh, because it leads you to the realization that there is more uh, than what your culture tells you there is, and that uh, um, this is not hidden from you or forbidden you. It's something that you just need to uh, um, believe in enough to explore and then take the time and energy to to learn the skill. And then you don't need books to tell you what's 
beyond you can explore and find that for yourself. Oh yeah, it, 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 in size, I think it's healthy because I, you know, again, I, I it's been I've been doing this so many years now. I don't even remember the dreams I had before that. But I mean, I it, it's always something exciting, and and I look forward to it. I got to ask you a question: What got you sure. in, into the paranormal? Since I was very young, uh, I've had paranormal experiences. And uh, um, again, I'm Greek. I grew up in a Greek household uh, of uh, first generation uh, Greeks here in America. And uh, it, Greece was at the time that I was growing up a lot more quote unquote superstitious than it is now. So uh, people believed in gypsy curses and they believed in uh, all sorts of non human intelligences, some of them from the myths. Uh, and they were proud of the fact that they were descended from the Olympians and from the kings and tribes of old and uh, uh, the Byzantine emperors. And so all that was very much a part of uh, daily uh, reality. So I grew up with uh, the understanding that such things were uh, real, and it was only when I started to become a teenager and older that I ran into trouble with it. And uh, then the challenge was, um, all of a sudden, not being able to d- describe things as you experience them, but to frame them in a way that other people would accept them and understand. So oh. I couldn't say that I see certain colors or that uh, um, what do you call it, a lady in white uh, told me this. You know, I, I learned that, no, that'll get you in trouble here in America uh, and among certain uh, Greeks who are very religious. Uh, so, again, I had to... Dis- it, it, it was kind of like uh, being blind, uh, not being blind, but living in a society that's blind and having eyes. So a lot of what you experienced, there really wasn't enough to have you make sense of it, uh, except through uh, mythology and through religion and through occultism. Um, And then there is the fact that most of the people around you uh, didn't seem to be able to perceive things. Um, so, and if you describe them in the way that you were perceiving them, uh, they would get uh, upset. So after a while, it's like I just learned to uh, explain things in a way that people will understand what I'm saying, but that didn't stop the uh, uh, perceptions, and I, I, I just basically kept them to myself, and, uh, you know, later on I came across uh, books like Tim Beckley's uh, uh, book, uh, books and uh, they here were a lot of people talking about these things and that led me uh, to more uh, hands-on explorations, exploring paranormal events, getting involved in channeling and uh, exploring uh, ancient exotic uh, and uh, modern exotic uh, spiritualities and uh, so it, it just went from there and uh, with the exotic spiritualities it was the same thing. I discovered that uh, there was that whole language uh, problem because uh, if you, like you said, with brainwashing, if you're taught to look at the world a certain way, it's hard to see the world in other ways. Oh, yeah. And and people who see the world in different ways have a difficult time uh, uh, talking to each other. There's like a language problem because of these concepts. So a lot of the work that I did in the past couple of years has been interfaith work. Um, getting people who believe we live in you know, different realities to communicate so they can better understand each other. And a lot of times it's nomenclature. Uh, if you listen long enough and if you have experience enough, you could relate what they're saying to things you might have experienced. So it becomes easier to crack their, their code, as it were. And uh, sometimes in terms of belief systems, you have a lot of people who subscribe to the same code because they've programmed themselves to experience the world in a certain way, and then it's tough for them to see the world differently. Oh, yeah. So, now, so that's kind of how I got into all that. Now, we need to go to break again. Can you hang in okay. for another, Can you hang in for at least another half an hour? That would be incredibly awesome. I'm enjoying myself a great deal. And I want to talk to you about, you mentioned, uh, you know, a gypsy curses and stuff like that. I, I got to ask you a couple questions when we come back on that, because sure. I, I do believe that curses do exist so but that's just me we'll be back in about two and a half minutes you're listening to hercules on night dreams talk radio after dark with me gary we'll be right back 